Let's open the scriptures to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to continue our series, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll be reading the first 11 verses. Follow with me. Verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however they were, you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Verse 7. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, another to the word of another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, and to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually just as he will. Trust God will add a blessing uh, to his word. As we consider another issue in the Corinthian church, we soon see that like much of the church today, the Corinthians' idea of true spirituality was an idea that was seriously infected by a counterfeit spirituality. And this was largely due or the result of ideas and values that the Corinthian believers had dragged into the church from the pagan culture in which they lived. And as a result, like we mentioned last week, the Corinthians seemed to have polluted most things, including the Lord's Supper. And here in this occasion, this brand new section from verses 12 right through uh, chapter 12, right through to chapter 14, which see, we see that they had lost the plot regarding the nature and the purpose and the use of spiritual gifts. True spiritual gifts, as we will see, are gifts given by God for the purpose of strengthening and nurturing unity and harmony for the effective witness of the church. But Satan loves to provide a counterfeit. And he goes all out providing that counterfeit within the church itself. And this counterfeit spirituality that Satan provides, it never strengthens the church, never provides unity, but only propagates selfishness and only weakens the church and wrecks the church's testimony and its effectiveness. The Corinthian believers' old life continued to contaminate the new. They never separated from their old former lives. They still hung on to that which is unclean. And we see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 17. Though they were richly endowed with spiritual gifts, and we're told that in verse 7 of chapter 1, that they did not lack in any gift. Okay? So they were richly endowed. As I've said before, the most gifted church of all time was the Corinthian church. But many in the Corinthian church only had a poor understanding of the gifts and they used them selfishly and irresponsibly. And when that happens, folks, when that happens, the body life and practice of the church is reduced to nothing 
but everyone banging their own drum to their own tune. And that only ever produces one thing, a very, very uncertain sound. Over the years, as you will well know, when children go to school, one of the basic things that they're taught as far as music goes is the humble recorder. You know that squawky thing that can go haywire now and again? And over the years I've sat in many class ensembles that are held at the end of the year, having my wife and I having five children, as you can imagine, you know, you go along to the functions and there they all get up and play their recorder, which they have diligently practiced at for goodness knows how long. But just about every time, bless their hearts, all is going well, and then one child, or maybe more than one, drops a note, or maybe completely misses one. And instantly, the whole ensemble's harmony is disrupted and marred. You know what I mean? A little bit like Pete this morning. Whoops, hang on there. Another key, you know. I didn't notice it, but he did. Folks, the local church is a little like an orchestra. Not recorders, because all the recorders are meant to be the same instrument. They are the same instruments. They play the same thing. But the local church is like an orchestra that is designed to produce certain harmonious sound. The sound or the message that we are to produce is only ever distorted when we do not play the right tune with a specific instrument that God has given to each one of us. You get the picture? Spiritual gifts are those instruments that God gives each believer to produce a harmony of worship, praise, and ministry for God. Spiritual gifts are to be used not only to produce a harmony, can we say, but also to be used in harmony for one another and with one another in the local church. So folks, what music... What sound? If I can use the analogy, are you playing for God's glory in this church or in your local church? Are you using your gift that God has given you rightly or are you using it wrongly? Or not using it at all? That's a question. A good question. You see, the Corinthians needed to to learn the difference between what was true giftedness and what was counterfeit. And as I said before, Satan loves to copy. But his copy will only ever produce uncertain sounds that leave heaps of gaps and disruption in the God-designed harmony of the church. That's all it will ever do. Well, this is what was happening in Corinth. They were ignorantly beating their own self as drums. And what we find here in chapter 12, right through to the end of chapter 14, that Paul addresses this problem. And so we go to the first point. Genuine spirituality exalts Christ as Lord. We see this in the first three verses. Now Paul begins this whole new subject, as I've said, from verse, chapter 12 to chapter 14. He... he begins this new subject by by coming alongside the Corinthian believers and I I really love this and notice that he calls them brethren he calls them brethren they were his brothers and sisters in the Lord they were not pretenders yes they had lots of issues and they had lots of problems as we have seen and walked our way through 1 Corinthians but they were not pretenders no doubt there were some that were but the the body of Christ, there were true believers in the Corinthian church. And here Paul addresses them as brethren. They were in the family of God. Now that's a great place to be, right? Because you're only in the family of God and only begin rightly to call brother and sister if you belong to the Lord. That's by God's grace through faith. Simple. Faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross. He's the one, only one that can deal with your sin. Your righteousness in God's sight, your righteousness that you can produce. You know what the Bible calls that? They are like filthy rags in his sight. So forget about you coming clean or being clean or being righteous. It's Christ's righteousness. It's imputed, passed on to you. 
that declares your righteousness. And then you belong to the family of God. And then we can call one another brethren. That's a great place to be. But then he launches into what may seem to be a topic that's, that's way off the subject of spiritual gifts. And this is in verse 2 and 3. And he says, You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of the God says, Jesus is cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now these words here raise a question, or they did for me. What does this have to do with spiritual gifts? There are a number of ideas on here, but this is the one that I've landed in, and I believe it's the explanation that makes the most sense in this. It seems to be that Paul is highlighting how the Corinthians were saved and that their pagan system or belief system that they once used to walk in and revel in was steeped in all sorts of idolatrous worship of dumb, dumb idols. That's what they used to involve themselves in before they were saved. Before they became Christians. Before they were brethren. Before they were in the family of God. Now these idols that they involved themselves in and carried out their festivities and worship, whatever you like to call it, they were mute. In other words, they couldn't speak. They were powerless. But these idols, as idols do today, had followers empowered by Satan to give counterfeit messages. You got that? These Counterfeit messages that were the, uh, the agents of these idols, as it were, spoke as if they came from God. These demonic messages came across as if they were the real deal, and they may have even been uttered, their messages at the temple or wherever they were, may have been, even been uttered in some ecstatic form, and it seems that some of the Corinthians were still caught up in all this, even as believers. So much so that they were being duped and were unable to distinguish between the work of God's spirit and the work of demonic, spirit, demonic spirits. See, what they were doing, they assimilated their spiritual gift with Satan's counterfeit. These pagan priests, they denied Christ. That's what it says in our, our, our text here. But some believers, some believers still embraced them. Why? Believing that they spoke from God. And they were really being deceived here on this. Well, if that is the case, Paul gives this warning to the church here at Corinth based on that. And in so doing, we can glean a warning ourselves this morning from this text. First one is, first warning we can glean from this section is, it is possible to counterfeit the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In other words, just because someone gives some kind of ecstatic utterance or, or maybe claim, the Lord told me, or, or maybe say, I have a word from the Lord for you, just because someone says that, or maybe someone is a gifted communicator with a great following, this or any of those things do not mean that they are being led by the Spirit of God. This morning is not new, by the way. This warning is not new. You remember in Jeremiah's day, there were false prophets. There were counterfeit prophets. And God denounces them big time. You look, read Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 16 and 17. And I'll just quote a section of that. This is what God says through Jeremiah. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into fertility. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. That was a warning that, that God gave through Jeremiah to the people of Israel. The people who worshipped Yahweh, the people who were for God and the God who had redeemed. So we can equate this even to our day. Wow, if it happened then, surely it can happen now. And I've got another example here in Acts 8 that many of you will be familiar with. For those who don't go to home group, sorry, you'll have to read it up to check it out. But you'll remember how in Acts 8, Simon the sorcerer, 
He was a magician, right? And he dazzled the people into thinking that he had divine power. Remember that? However, it was not divine power behind Simon's razzmatazz. No way. It was demonic power. And yet all the people, you know, you know what all the people, all the people were seduced of the day. They were, they were sucked into this. You know what the scriptures say, how they considered and what they considered Simon to be and how they considered his words. This is what it says in Acts 8 verse 9 to 11. From the smallest to the greatest, and that means everyone, whether they were important or non-important, whether they were rich or whether they were poor. From the smallest to the greatest where they were giving attention to him, that is Simon, saying, this man is called the great power of God. The Corinthians were being sucked into a similar situation through a lack of spiritual discernment and were therefore gullible. They were ignorant of discerning true from the false. And this reminds us of a sobering message, by the way, that Jesus tells us all in, in Matthew chapter 7. Remember that? This is in the Sermon on the Mount. And on Matthew chapter 7, he warns that some will come before him on the last day, a day yet future, when, when men stand before God and give an account. He will say that some will come before him on the last day and they'll point to the miracles they performed or those whom they follow performed. They'll point to prophecies spoken. They'll, they'll speak of the demons that they cast out. And, and, and all their other religious action. And you know what the Lord says? What scripture says there? The Lord will say, depart from me. I never knew you. How sobering is that? Throughout the Bible, we are told that we need to be discerning folks. Lacking in spiritual discernment. You see opens up the door to gullibly believing Satan's counterfeit messengers and their message. They would be discerning. Secondly, we need to recognize that there's always a temptation to seek the experience rather than the Lord Jesus himself. It's so easy to do this. It's so easy to do. We're tangible people. We like the hands-on stuff, Right? There's a sort of a part in us, and I think it's the flesh of the believer that likes to, to walk by sight and not by faith too many times. Remember again Simon in chapter 8, Acts chapter 8? He was a guy who was this magician, and he saw Philip and Peter and John displaying the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit in their day. They were performing miracles. They were touching people and they were healed. All that sort of stuff. Read Acts chapter 8. And Simon was enamored with the miraculous and he wanted that power for himself. He even asked Peter if he could cut a deal and buy that power. He obviously wanted to revamp his magical arts business with greater clout. Uh, to at least restore his celebrity because it had dropped off a bit, right? There was new men in town. Real men of God. He wanted people to think that he was a, a true spiritual guru and, and that he was God's man for the people based on what he could do and what he could say. All the tangible stuff. See folks, Simon really completely missed the point. It is so tempting to want to do spiritual things and even copycat spiritual experiences and actions of others. And we can easily do this without ever seeking the Lord in faith. As I said before, we love, we have a tendency to want to walk by sight and not by faith. But as people of God, we are those who walk by faith and not by sight. I mean... We seek the experience without ever faithfully seeking the Lord and His Word and asking, Lord, what will you have me to do? That's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. Hence, Paul warned the Corinthian believers that they needed to test any teacher who claimed to be God's mouthpiece with a doctrinal test. Now, that's heavy, right? After all, who wants doctrine? Who wants theology? But no, he said, you've got to test them. And here's the test. How do they view Jesus? Do they dis 
dismiss him or do they embrace him? There's the doctrinal test. This is where theology kicks in. How do they view Jesus Christ? Folks, it's only gullible people that look purely at experiences or great things people do for determining biblical spirituality. The first measure of biblical spirituality is purely doctrinal. It is theological. If any person holds a derogatory or a low view of Jesus Christ, a view that demeans him in any way, shape or form, or a view that is out of sync with Scripture, then they are clearly not of God. Steer clear of them. Even teachers who claim that Jesus only ever loves and His desire for you is to be healthy and wealthy. That's what Jesus is all about. Those who claim that, dear folks, are false teachers. Are false teachers. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7 says, Beware of false prophets. These are Jesus' words in that same sermon. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Counterfeit prophets. Counterfeit messages. And folks, sad to say, there are heaps of these kind of leaders and people in the church today. And sad to say, many people, gullible people, who lack discernment, follow them. We should always compare a teaching or practice with the Word of God. That is the testing of discerning. We should test if something is of the Holy Spirit of God. Even people or those who, who, who say that Jesus is a good man, or a great man. He always, he, they would even say that, that Jesus it was a son of God, which is wrong for a start. Jehovah's Witnesses do that. Mormons do that. All the cults demean Jesus Christ. None of these things qualify. Basically, it's equating the statement, Jesus is a curse of It needs to be an exalting and a surrendering in word and life as Jesus is Lord. Remember Thomas, the disciple? No, no, I will not believe. Unless I can place my finger in the nail prints of his hand and my my hand into his side. No, no, I won't accept this. We know this end story, right, of his, his situation where Jesus appears to him. He didn't need to do. But there was a spiritual empowerment and an enlightenment that came upon Thomas that day. And he bows before the Savior when he sees him. And he says, my Lord and my God. Basically, Paul is saying here, if someone is wrong about Jesus, they are false teachers, steer clear of them, be discerning, don't be duped. As I said before, sad to say there are many people like that following a spiritual path based on words and actions of false teachers. Teachers who became famous or have become famous and attract great numbers through rhetoric, persuado miracles and wonders. Even, it's often sprinkled with some truth. You ever heard of that? On that basis, people embrace them when they're teaching. And it's all from a counterfeit spirit. It's not a gift from God. And how devastating that is. How devastating that is. Folks, Christ is the one whom we must follow and take heed to, for he is the what? He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. Amen? Amen. Secondly, genuine spiritual gifts are varied for a purpose. This is where we come into the gifts part here in verses 4 to 7. And so having reaffirmed to the believers the need to measure spiritual leadership or, or, or spiritual teaching, by these folk having a right view of Jesus Christ, what Paul does now is he turns to the believers for them to measure their own understanding and use of spiritual gifts in the church. So moving away from those whom we follow or whom we listen to or whom we take on board or whom we discern either true or false from, and, and, and he wants them to look inwardly now. Because we're all part of the body, right? 
of Christ. And the problem in the Corinthian church was that though they were not lacking in any gift as we've, as we've already discovered in verse 7 of chapter 1, they misused their gifts. And as a result, they lived according to the flesh and not the spirit. And we can do that, by the way. We do do that, sad to say. And this resulted in the Corinthian situation in gross misconduct and divisions as we have seen and, and tracked through as we've come into Corinthians thus far. A spiritual gift is a free and undeserved capacity for spiritual ministry given to each one of us by the Holy Spirit to strengthen the unity and ministry of the local assembly. God gives each believer, so none of you who belong to the Lord here miss out on this. God gives each believer without exception, as we're told in verse 7 of our text this morning, a gift or gifts, see that? And this seems to be given the moment we trust in Christ as our Saviour and Lord. Our spiritual gifts often involve things that we are naturally good at. However, they are not the same as our natural abilities. We must understand that. They're not the same. Every person, after all, every person, believer or unbeliever, has some natural ability, right? Some more than others. But only the believer has been supernaturally gifted. You got that? Supernaturally gifted with the capacity to supernaturally minister to others, especially in the assembly. This is so encouraging and yet so humbling. You see, it's not about me. And it's not me. It's God's power working through me. A spiritual gift is a, is a work of God's Spirit that enables us as individuals to do His work in a way that we could never do before. And we can discern several important lessons about spiritual gifts from our text. And the first one is we're not all gifted to do the same thing. We see this in verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. You see, good students of the Word here will notice that there is a repetition of words. And the two words that are repeated here are varieties, or you may have different in your version, uh, same thing, and, and, and the other word is same. In other words, there are different gifts given, suited for different ministries, which have different effects or accomplishments. But there is one God who is behind and the source of them all. The point Paul is making here is that essential to the unity of any Bible-following, believing church, essential to the unity of that church is the diversity of gifts and their function by the different members in that church. This is not about uniformity, by the way. A very different meaning. That's when we all want to be the same. It's like, imagine if all the Aussie cricket team were top-notch bowlers, and that's it. The batting would soon collapse big time, wouldn't it? You see, God is not short on the gifts He has given folks. And there is no shortage of ministries, and it's only when this diversity is in action that we will see the variety of accomplishments. And because your gift is supernaturally given at salvation, you can be assured using your gift will reap rewards and eternal dividends. Secondly, we see that spiritual gifts are given for the common good. You know that, for the common good? This is where a lot of people get it wrong. And for the common good means to, to, to help or, or confer a benefit or to be mutually beneficial. And the purpose of that is for the building up and nurture of the unity in the local assembly. Now this is a far cry from many today 
who treat spiritual gifts as a kind of a measuring stick. A measuring stick of one's spiritual status or of one's spiritual kudos. It's not that at all. It's not that at all. Some believe the greater my gift, the greater I should be respected or the greater I am in the sight of people and God. You see, when your gift is more of a public one, one that is seen, or more of a private one, and not so much seen, gifts are given for the good of the assembly, and the assemblies misses out if all of them are not in action. It kind of limps along in order to survive, rather than thriving that's the purpose of gifts so what are they and are we using them that's a good question genuine spiritual gifts given and described in verses 8 to 11 to gain a more comprehensive description of the gifts that we're talking about of course we need to go to, say, Romans chapter 12. We're given a list there. And we certainly need to go to First Peter chapter 4. And here, of course, in this section we read today. But here in our text, Paul gives a sample. Just a sample. In order to describe the variety of gifts, as mentioned in verse 4. So let's not miss the wood for the trees here as we, as we look at this text by itself. You see, because Paul's main focus is to illustrate the variety and the divine source of these gifts and how that they are for the common good of the local church. So that's his main point. But as a footnote, I want to make clear that if you studied the topic of spiritual gifts in the scriptures, you would find that scripture reveals two kinds of gifts. There are those that were more temporary and there were those that were permanent. The temporary gifts were what we call the apostolic gifts, those gifts that were given to the apostles for the unique establishment and setting up of the early church that we're looking at in our home groups. These gifts like the miraculous healings and the performing of miracles and the speaking of tongues without any any training whatsoever, miraculously happening, and the interpretation of them, all these were given to authenticate these men of God in the early church, the apostles, as being God's true messengers with His true message. It was like a stamp of approval from God. He gave them that ability, that power, that giftedness, to authenticate who they were and what their message was and that it was true. It was needed for their credibility. Why? Because the full canon of Scripture, the self-authenticating Scripture, was not completed at this stage. So today, the church does not have apostles, as we see here in the book of Acts. It does not. The job of establishing and setting up the church and getting that foundation, it was a, it's a done deal. It's complete. Hence, we do not need the use of these temporary gifts. As I said before, as now we have God's self-authenticating and all-sufficient word. The permanent gifts, on the other hand, include a variety also. Like wisdom and knowledge and you have to understand what those words mean. Faith and teaching and giving and leading and serving and helping. We all see these and if you look in the wider context of the gifts topic. These are those gifts given to, by God to equip us in order to serve and manifest something of the supernatural Holy Spirit in the church. And as we think about this, like sometimes we get sidetracked in thought and deed, don't we? And we can easily treat the church, the local church, like a, like a natural organism that depends on our natural abilities and our natural strengths, just like any other club that you might belong to or join or worthy organization. 
But the church, this church, is a supernatural organism. You see that? You don't belong to ordinary club folks. This is a supernatural body of Lord's people here. You are a very special people. That's why God, you're a peculiar people. God has called you, chosen you, predestined you, and He's saved you, He's redeemed you through Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith. And when that happens, He infuses into you the ability, the capacity, which is a supernatural gift, to supernaturally minister to others. Now you would say, why, well, yeah, but when I help or when I lead, I don't feel any flashes of lightning or feel like I'm floating on air or anything like that. Uh, I, I don't see stars or, or what I would expect from some supernatural mystical happening. No, 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 no. Don't even expect it. It doesn't happen that way. It's a little bit like... I could preach this sermon here or someone else could preach this sermon here. Um, I could preach it today and have little effect. Someone else could preach another sermon and, and, but on the same lines or even in the same words. And if the Holy Spirit wishes to use that preacher to effect whatever he wants, he will do it. See what it means? And none of the preachers or whether you're helping or leading uh, are going to feel necessarily anything special. It's God that works through us. So don't give up. Just keep on keeping on. Even though it feels ordinary. Understand that you are a supernatural being. I love this. I remember a professor of mine at Bible College. And he was doing a bit of traveling backs and forwards. And he was in an airplane one day. And sure enough, he wanted to sit by himself. He was tired. And and he just wanted to sit by himself and and just lax. But sure enough, someone else plumped themselves right beside him. And before, and he was, and this person was a talker. You know what it's like when you want to be quiet and another person's a talker? Well, this person's a talker. And sure enough, oh, and what do you do? This professor, this... Um, You'll know him, Steve. I've just slipped his name. He's passed away now. Um, he's, he was American. He used to be down there. Anyway, he probably said a little bit in the flesh, but it was quite true. He says, I'm an intergalactical warrior. <laughs> uh, in some kind of way, there was a bit of truth in that, right? Because he was. This guy was, he was a, he was a vessel of the Lord like any true born-again believer is. And we're supernatural beings. We have the Spirit of God in us, and we have a supernatural gift to supernaturally minister to others. We're endowed spiritually, supernaturally, with a supernatural gift to use. Not for our own pleasure, but for the common good of all. You got that? The local church is the sphere, the environment that the Holy Spirit wants to be manifested in. And that manifestation is to be seen by every single believer. There's the harmony as we see in verse 7. In other words, use the gift or the gifts God has given you. Because the manifestation of the Spirit is not just via one man. Or even just a small few in a greater number. You see, because that only ever makes a distorted sound. The Lord wants the full orchestra, folks. The full orchestra. Whether it be 60 or 70 like we have here, or or whether it be 500, He wants the full orchestra. Each one in harmony, using their gift, producing a spirit-filled song of testimony to the Lord. The challenge is this. Are we equipped? You might be saying, but am am I equipped? I know I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, am I equipped? Absolutely you are. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are absolutely equipped, supernaturally. You have been supernaturally gifted to contribute to the body, life, and harmonious function and witness of this church. Or the church that you belong to. We are gifted to be participants, folks. Never mere spectators, okay? We are gifted to be stewards, never volunteers. We have been entrusted with a supernatural gift to use and invest for the good of our brothers and sisters in the church. Or as 1 Peter 4.10 says, as each one has received a special gift, you got that? As each one has received a special gift, employ it. 
in serving one another as good stewards, not volunteers, stewards of the manifold grace of God. Folks, we all have a role to play, and you know what? Note how verse 11 says, it's not only the Holy Spirit who sovereignly distributes all spiritual gifts, but it is also the Holy Spirit who what? Who works all things. You see that? Works all things. So the bottom line here is, it's the Holy Spirit that does the work. It's not you, not me. It's Him. The supernatural gift that you have needs a willing and surrendered heart and when that submission takes place God works through that gift by the power of the Holy Spirit and it's only when you understand this that you will see that with God all things are possible folks never ever ever limit what God has done in you I know we don't do that because we're saved and we, and we can praise His name for that and, we, and it's right that we do so. But never limit that, but never ever also limit what He can do through you. By a hard heart, a doubting heart, a hold back heart, or I'm not good enough kind of heart, or that's not me kind of heart. He wants a surrendered heart, an obedient heart. In a few weeks we're going to look at more detail of how and why our spiritual gifts are to be employed by each one of us and maybe how we can employ them but so we just had a had, had a kind of a foundation class of spiritual gifts today and what they're all about and so I'll leave you there shall we pray our gracious God we bow acknowledging that we are sinners saved by grace